Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivers. I am the uh, Carb Addiction Doc. And, you know, I know that we speak a lot on this channel and many people on the internet are talking about ideal metabolic markers and uh, I must have an A1C of this, my cholesterol needs to be this, my... Uh, so, there are there clearly are markers, and we've done this on this channel, markers of ideal health. What are we striving for? But let's flip this around. So many of you are not sure how sick you actually are. And so many of you have friends and relatives who blow you off in terms of, oh, I'm fine. Or you look at someone and they look fit and they look healthy. And we think, oh my goodness, they must be so healthy because they look this way. So today's video, I'm going to discuss metabolic risk factors. So which numbers are serious concerns that we're wayward in terms of our eating pattern? Which results define for us? And it doesn't matter if you're five years old or 100 years old. Well, you won't be 100 because you'll be dead. But um, maybe 50. Which of these markers are serious red flags that there is metabolic disease happening, primarily insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia? And the first obvious one is body weight. And everybody's got an opinion of body weight. But we want to generalize this. We want to look at what is a point at which you cannot ignore problematic body weight. Okay? And of course, there's going to be the exceptions. But the first thing about body weight is if you look at your height and your weight and you calculate your BMI with a standard BMI of 25 to 26. If you then calculate a BMI, so you take that weight and your height and you calculate your BMI and you look at 50 pounds above a BMI of 26. If you are 50 pounds, no matter how tall you are, if you are 50 pounds fatter than a BMI of 26, that is a serious metabolic risk factor. And we're not just talking about a few pounds overweight. We're talking about somebody who, and, and why do I use that number? Because that number defines biologically profound insulin resistance. You cannot be that heavy without being insulin resistant. But it also defines for me a particular behavior pattern. This is an entrenched routine way of eating that is harmful. This is not somebody who went on holiday and picked out a little bit and gained 10 pounds. This is somebody who has a lifestyle that is conducive to being fat. So the first one is BMI. And I use 50 pounds over 20, BMI of 26. I personally am obesogenic. In other words, if I walk past the donut, I'm going to gain five pounds. Weight gain is the way my body protects me from sugar. So one of the things I've changed apart from being on a ketogenic diet, because I hate to use this word, but calories are an issue, I like to suppress or reduce caloric consumption. And as such, I have created a Mondays as no calorie Mondays. But as you know, you never want to white knuckle your way through a fast, to a 48 hour fast. So there are times when it's easy and it's straightforward. There are times when I'm really dragging, particularly if I'm not in ketosis where I'm exhausted. That's when I'll use a ketone IQ. Ketone IQ, Cheryl and myself have found, is the best formula to rapidly promote a ketogenic bloodstream. Well, I've got ketones in my blood work, not a big spike, but a gradual rise that lasts about five hours. And I may use this in the morning of that fasting, although I'll often use my coffee, but the time I most struggle is in the evening. When I'm about to have dinner, but I don't want to have dinner, and I'll hit one of these guys, it'll help me to cross to the next day. If I'm in ketosis the next day, I'm good to go. May use one again the next morning, but I strongly, strongly support ketone IQ to help you through your fasting. Even if you're trying to go from two mad to OMAD, two meals a day to one meal a day, and you're struggling at lunchtime, pop one of these babies in, <laughs> make sure you chase it with some coffee or some tea, but it'll help you to transition that time we ordinarily would eat. Now, is it, act no, we're not talking about nuances, and you can argue with me all day long, but by the time you meet that criteria, there is no ambiguity beyond being problematic. Now, if you're Arnold Schwarzenegger who had a BMI of 38.3 and he was at a body fat percentage of 31, those are the exceptions. If you're a bodybuilder and you're on steroids and you, yeah, Arnold was on steroids and you, and you are massive because it's all muscle, that's a different story. 
And there with those 50 pounds, you can use the buck naked mirror test. I like the buck naked mirror test instead of a DEXA scan. Get yourself, get your buck naked, buck naked ass in front of a mirror and look at yourself. And if you're fluffy and fat, you're not Arnold Schwarzenegger. Okay, it's that simple. It's not rocket science. The second marker, and, and this is a difficult thing to, to get to, but the second marker is your blood glucose. But everybody gets obsessed over spot glucose. They do a blood glucose in the morning. It's 120. Oh my God, I got diabetes. You might have just had a crappy night. You might have been full of adrenaline. A spot glucose doesn't matter that much. I like to look at average blood sugars. Not A1C yet, but average blood sugars. And the ideal for me is somewhere between a two-day and a seven-day average. So I'm wearing a CGM. And this is the Dexcom CGM. And the clarity app on the Dexcom CGM, and even now the G7 CGM app, gives me, well, give me a three-day average or a five-day average or a seven-day average, but it'll allow me to see my average blood sugars. And if your two-day average blood sugar is substantially above 120, that's a problem. That's a problem. You are absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, insulin resistant and hyperinsulinemic. So average blood sugar above 120. Now, normal average blood sugar should be below 95. So we've got big wiggle room, but this is, these are serious metabolic risk factors. So an average blood sugar above 120. If you can never, ever measure ketones. So you've got a keto mojo, but you're never in ketosis. That's a serious risk factor as well. I don't, anywhere from 0.3 and above is fine. But if you're not in ketosis at any time through the day, that's a problem. Now, hemoglobin A1C. A, hemoglobin, a normal hemoglobin A1C is 5.2 or lower, at which your average blood sugar is not contributing to your, to your risk of a heart attack or a stroke. However, metabolic dysfunction is a hemoglobin A1C of 5.7 or 5.6. You don't have to be fully diabetic, but if you've got a hemoglobin A1C of 5.7 or higher, that is a serious metabolic risk factor. And how many doctors don't say, oh, you're fine, drink less Coke, exercise a little bit more, your A1C is 5.9 or 6.1, you're not diabetic, ha, 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 you're still fine. Bullshit, you're not. 5.7. Hmm. Now, here's where the biggest conflict comes in your lipids. If your total cholesterol is below 150, that's a problem. I typically want it above 200. If you're below 150, that's a serious problem. If your LDL cholesterol is below 100, that's a serious problem. Those are the target ranges for people on statins. They want your total cholesterol below 150. They want your, your LDL below 90, ideally lower than that. That's what they're targeting with medication. And yet I will tell you, you've got serious metabolic dysfunction if your cholesterol is below, total cholesterol below 150 and your LDL cholesterol below 100. Because you're not eating enough fat. And that is, those are some serious metabolic markers for me. On the flip side, we look at three other numbers. We look at your triglycerides, we look at your HDL, and we look at your VLDL. If your triglycerides, if your triglycerides are above 125, well, the upper limit of the test is 150. If your triglycerides are above 125, that is a serious metabolic risk factor, in my opinion. If your HDL cholesterol is below 50, 49 or lower, that is a serious metabolic risk factor. And if your VLDL is above 18, that is a serious metabolic risk factor. Because they denote the risk of cardiovascular disease. If your uric acid is above 6, 6.0, that is a significant metabolic marker. Now, a lot of my carnivores will have uric acid above that. That's because they're wasting protein. But usually, a uric acid in an obese person or a diabetic person is related to fructose consumption. And fructose is your most harmful sugar. And if your, if your uric acid is above 6, that puts you at inflammatory risk. The uric acid is actually an anti-inflammatory marker. It's, a, it's an anti-inflammatory molecule. But if you require 6, or if your 6 is trying to waste protein or waste fructose, that's a problem because six is a problematic number, six and above. Does it make sense to you? So if you don't have a lot of vascular inflammation, your uric acid is usually going to be low unless you're trying to waste protein or waste fructose.
But an elevated uric acid is a serious risk factor. Most people don't even measure uric acid. Gamma glutamyl transferase, above 15. That's inflammation of the liver. That is a fatty liver. Whether it's alcohol or whether it's carbohydrates, that's a fatty liver. Gamma glutamyl transferase, above 15. Ferritin, marker of intracellular inflammation, a ferritin above 150, and absolutely a ferritin over 300, absolutely a marker of inflammation. A resting heart rate, a calm resting heart rate above 85. Obviously atrial fibrillation. But a resting heart rate above 85 is a serious concern for me. Blood pressure. Blood pressure above 140 over 90 at rest. Serious concern. If you are doing less than one hour of physical activity a day, sorry, not a day, a week. If you are doing less than an hour of physical activity a week, that is a serious metabolic risk factor. There are many others that we can talk about. But those are the ones that I look at. There are plenty others. But those are easily measured. Those are easy things you can do at home or in simple blood work. CAC score, above 400. Serious risk factor. Now, 100 is my number, below 100. But if you're above 400, that is a serious call to action. Most doctors don't even get a CAC score. So those are the metabolic markers, folks, that if you're talking to your friends, if you're talking to, oh, why do you eat this way? You shouldn't eat this way. I'm perfectly healthy. I'm Okay, let's prove it. Don't tell me you're healthy because you exercise. Don't tell me you're healthy because you drink Diet Coke. Let's look at your blood work. Let's look at your parameters. And if you meet those criteria, if there's certainly more than one or two of those criteria that are positive, you ain't so healthy. And those are objective data points. It's not epidemiology. It's not this thing is associated with this. Those are markers of insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia. Whether you're on the diabesogenic side, whether you're on the obesogenic side, it is going to kill you early. And then it is your choice when you correct them. If you want to know what yours are, if you want your measurements done, if you want help in reducing them, how do I, how do I reduce this? Give us a shout. Set up a visit. 561-517-0642. Contact us. Call Kim. Set up a visit. And if you like what we're talking about, if you want to show any of your friends, your family members this Christmas, this video, and have them evaluate themselves. Because their doctors won't. The doctors will blow off an A1C above 5.7. The doctors will blow off where they are. If your treatment goal is an A1C below 7 and 5.7 is my standard for bad health, with 5.2 being good health, <laughs> I am the Carb Addiction Doc. Till next time.